Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 21 to 25. So first I'll show you guys the questions so that you guys can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 21, it says embolisms occur when a globular mass becomes lodged in a blood vessel and can cause strokes. An embolism occurring due to a gas bubble in the blood is likely to occur when? So an embolism is when something is blocking blood flow in a blood vessel, so something becomes lodged. And now we're asked, when can a gas bubble type embolism form in the blood? So for this question, try to keep in mind some general chemistry. So the ideal gas law, you should know that PV equals to NRT, and then we can also write this like this. P equals N over V times RT, and then this thing over here, that's just concentration because it's N over V, so moles over the volume, that's just concentration. So that's the same thing as P is equal to C, RT, and then from this you should know that when pressure goes up, then the concentration also goes up, so it's directly related, it's proportional. However, temperature is inversely proportional. When temperature goes up, then concentration goes down. And then this is the most important thing to keep in mind. So you can also think about this when you have a can of soda. If the pressure is high and the soda bottle is still closed, then the concentration of the gas is high, and so your carbon dioxide is really dissolved inside your liquid, inside the actual soda that you have, and then when you decrease the pressure and you open this can of soda, then because of the decrease in pressure, the concentration now is also going to decrease, and then you have less gas inside the soda and it doesn't taste as great. And similarly, when the temperature is high, you have less gas inside the soda, so it doesn't taste as great as if the temperature was low and you had a cold can of soda. So after talking about that, let's go through the options. Option A is saying if alveolar pressure is very high, would that cause a gas bubble? No, it would not because if the pressure in the alveoli was high, then that is going to force gas to come into the capillaries and then we're going to have gas coming into the bloodstream. But because we have this membrane that is lining the outside of the blood vessel, we can't just get bubbles of gas coming directly inside the blood vessels, so it has to diffuse. And so our cardiovascular system is set up so that we have slow blood flow where the alveoli are, and then the blood can slowly come and diffuse into the capillaries, and we don't get any gas bubbles coming into the capillaries, we just get the gas slowly diffusing and dissolving into the capillaries, and then it's taken away back towards the heart. So if alveolar pressure is high, that doesn't necessarily mean that gas bubbles are going to form. Option B is saying when an individual undergoes rapid decompression. So rapid decompression is when, for example, when you're scuba diving, you are very low beneath a lot of layers of water and that is inserting a lot of pressure on you and then you come back up, but you don't come back up slowly, you come back up rapidly. So way faster than you should. And yes, that's correct. This can lead to a gas bubble forming inside your blood vessels, which is also known as the bends, because what happened is you had an increased pressure and therefore an increased concentration of blood or of gases dissolved inside the blood. And then when you came up as the pressure decreased, that blood, it can no longer have as much gas dissolved in it. And so the gas starts to diffuse or it starts to come out of the blood. So it starts to crash out of the blood because it can no longer be dissolved inside the blood. If you do this slowly enough, it's controlled. But if you do it quickly, then your your body senses a great change in pressure. And so there's a, there's a dramatic shift in pressure from a high pressure to a lower one. And then now immediately this gas cannot dissolve. So instead of slowly coming out of the blood vessels or it, instead of slowly coming out of the blood that is dissolved in, it comes out quickly and that's in the form of a bubble. 
that is formed within your blood vessels and then this bubble can go and travel throughout your blood vessels until it gets to a point at which it's lodged and it can't really go forward anymore and that is an embolism and it disrupts your blood flow. So option B is correct and it's because of this change in pressure that we have a gas bubble forming. Option C is talking about an individual taking blood thinning medications. This is relevant when we're talking about embolisms or blood clots, but not so much when we're talking about gas bubbles being the embolism, because it's not going to control how much gas can dissolve inside the blood. This can stop the formation of blood clots so that we don't get an irregular blood clot, but it's not really relevant for gas bubbles, so that option is incorrect. And then finally, option D is talking about blood pressure being very high. Just because the pressure of the blood itself, the, the pressure which is being squeezed away from the heart and then going in the arteries towards the rest of the body is high, doesn't mean that it's going to have a direct effect on how much gas is dissolved inside the blood. It's more so the pressure as acting upon the system. And so that's it for this question. B is the correct answer. In question 22, we're asked which of the following describes the difference between meiosis in human males and females. So we're talking about meiosis, so formation of the gametes in between males and females. So what's the difference? Well, when you have meiosis, first of all, you have one cell and it splits up into two cells. That's meiosis one. And then each of those split up into two cells as well. That's meiosis two. So this is what occurs in males. And so you get four gametes at the end, but then that doesn't really occur in females. In females, it's a lot more irregular. So you might get one bigger one and then like a smaller one. And then when this splits up, same thing, you get a bigger one and then a smaller one. And then this one could split up as well into two smaller bodies. And so in males, so this one was females. In males, you get four equal gametes, whereas in females, you get one main large egg, and then you get three smaller polar bodies. And so most of the cytoplasm and nutrients in females went towards one gamete, whereas it's more equally distributed in males. So option A is saying males produce two sperm per sp spermatogonium while females produce one egg per primary oocyte. That's incorrect. It is correct that females produce one egg, but it's incorrect that males produce two sperm. They produce four. Option B is saying males produce four sperm. That's correct. While females produce one egg. That is correct. So the correct answer for this is option B. Option C is saying males produce one sperm, that's incorrect, while females produce one egg. So the male part is incorrect. And then option D is saying males produce four sperm, that's correct, while females produce two eggs. So females do not produce two eggs, they produce one egg per primary oocyte, and therefore option D is also incorrect. So B is the only correct answer in question 22. In question 23, it says a particular hormone is discovered to induce its effects by binding to surface proteins of receptor cells rather than passing through the membrane and activating intracellular receptors. This hormone is most likely which of the following types. So a hormone can bind either on the surface of the cell or go through the plasma membrane and then bind to a receptor on the inside. We're saying we have a particular hormone which binds to surface proteins. So that means that it is not able to cross the plasma membrane. So to be able to cross, cross the plasma membrane, you need to be something that is, you need to be a hormone which is small and then not too charged. So it should be mainly hydrophobic, but it's fine if it has some hydrophilic regions as well, as long as it's not really too charged and, so, and as long as it is a small molecule as well. So that means that if something is binding to the surface proteins, it is likely a large molecule and then it's probably very polar or charged as well. So we're looking for something like that. And then option A is saying a peptide hormone. Yes, that's the correct answer. A peptide hormone is made up of a few, at least two different amino acids. And then due to that, 
it's going to be a large molecule, so it's not able to cross a plasma membrane. It's also likely to be polar because amino acids, their side groups are polar. However, it could have a hydrophobic side chain, but then we also have like the N and C terminals of the amino acids, so those also lend more polarity, and then it's, it's very possible that this peptide hormone is charged as well because of the different oxygens and nitrogens that it contains. So due to that, a peptide hormone is likely to bind on the surface rather than diffusing through the plasma membrane. A steroid hormone would be incorrect because that is definitely going to go through the plasma membrane into the inside of the cell. And then a tyrosine-based hormone, it kind of depends on which hormone we're talking about. But if it's based on tyrosine, meaning it's derived from tyrosine, it's derived from just one amino acid, so it's a small molecule. So it's likely able to pass through the plasma membrane. And then it also has some hydrophob it has some hydrophobic character, so it's not really that polar. And so because of those two things, a tyrosine-based hormone would be able to go through the plasma membrane. And so it can bind intracellularly, although it's possible that it could also bind extracellularly. And so you might think that a tyrosine-based hormone might be the correct answer, but in comparison to a peptide hormone, a peptide hormone is definitely and much more likely going to bind on the outside of the cell rather than inside where a tyrosine-based hormone might be able to go to the inside. And we're asked, this hormone is most likely which type? It's most likely going to be a peptide hormone. And then D is incorrect saying that we don't have enough information. No, we can determine it just based on the different classification of hormones that were given. And then we should know from that name, like what properties the hormone possesses. In question 24, it says Horner's syndrome is a condition where there are issues with a particular ganglion in the cervical region. So talking about in the head region, meaning we're talking about the central nervous system, resulting in a constricted pupil and lack of sweating on the face. Okay, so we have an issue in the central nervous system, which is affecting the cervical region or the head region. And so it's affecting something in the head region, meaning anywhere in the head, but particularly we're told now in the face. And it results in a constricted pupil and lack of sweating on the face. Which of the following holds true regarding this syndrome? So we have a face which has a constricted pupil and then you can't sweat. Where we know, or we should know that these are, these are things which are controlled by the parasympathetic system of the autonomic nervous system. So that is a part of the autonomic nervous system that's responsible for constricting the pupil whereas the sympathetic nervous system will dilate the pupil. And in the parasympathetic system, it's it will lead to not sweating, or so it, it doesn't directly control sweating, whereas the sympathetic nervous system is the one which does control sweating. So if we can't sweat, it seems like we have a problem with the sympathetic nervous system because that is the one which would induce sweating. And it is also the one which would dilate the pupils. And so if we don't have something dilating the pupils, it makes sense that the parasympathetic nervous system kind of takes over and then constricts the pupils. So it seems like we have a problem with the sympathetic nervous system. And so C is the correct answer. The syndrome results in a sympathetic dysfunction in the face. B is incorrect because if we had a parasympathetic dysfunction, then we wouldn't get this constriction of the pupil. And then D is also correct, incorrect because it's talking about all of the above. And then option A is saying the syndrome is likely to, likely due to an increase in the activity of astrocytes in the central nervous system. That's incorrect. So astrocytes kind of support the neurons in the central nervous system. They have a few different tasks, such as maintaining and controlling the blood brain barrier, maintaining the concentration of different ions in the blood around the central nervous system, and then also providing nutrients to the central nervous system. So these are some of the, f the functions of the astrocytes. They support the central nervous system, but if we had an increase in their activity, that kind of seems like, okay, we might have some problems overall in the central nervous system. It's almost like there's a tumor growing there, and so it's impeding the function of the neurons, but it wouldn't be clear that that would directly lead to a problem in the sympathetic nervous system. If something like that happened, we would see a few different characteristics 
And so it would be a lot more clear that we have overabundance of the pro of the functions that the astrocytes take care of. So we need to know exactly what astrocytes do. And then if we have too much of that going on, it seems like, okay, it's the astrocyte which is responsible for that function. So this syndrome is likely due to an increase in astrocytes. And then based on like the problems that we see in neurons not able to perform their function properly, that would occur in many different regions and with many different functions that the, the neurons can perform and not so much just specifically the sympathetic division. But because we seem to have a problem with the sympathetic division and not both the parasympathetic and sympathetic, it seems like this syndrome is more specific for the sympathetic division and so not really related to astrocytes but related to the actual neurons in the sympathetic system. So C is a much better answer than any of the other ones. And in question 25, it says that during which of the following phases does the cell replicate its DNA? So there are four main phases in the cell cycle. First of all, we have G1, which is the first gap phase. In that, we have growth of the cell, and it's getting ready to replicate its DNA, but that's not the one in which it actually replicates its DNA. That's the S phase. So in the synthesis phase, that's the one in which DNA is replicated. So which one do we get replication of DNA? That would be S phase. After that, we get the one in option D, which is the G2 phase. And that is another gap phase. There's a bit more growth. And now the cell is getting ready to see if it has passed all the checkpoints and it's, it, it should move into mitosis or not. And then if it does, then it goes into the M phase, which is mitosis. So this is the replication of the cell and then creation of daughter cells. But it's only during the S phase where we have replication of DNA. So the correct answer is B, the S phase. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course on teachable.com. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through a lot more questions and then go through all the different answer options, just like we went through in this video. Otherwise, make sure to subscribe to this channel to make sure you don't miss any videos that we post over here. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.